alcohol is the most prevalent, most permissive drug in society, mm -hmm. to therefore fall foul of it and then be accused of or feel shamed by weakness is just ironic, really. You know, it's the, it's the, only, it's the only drug we have to apologize for not wanting to have. Welcome to Another Door Podcast. Another Door is a place that you come to when you're rethinking your work. Whether it's job loss, a career change, or you just want to rethink how you are doing your work right now. Come and find us at anotherdoor.co.uk. On the podcast in this episode, I am speaking to Anna Donahue. She caught my eye with a post on a network that we are both part of all about her kind of side project that she has around helping people to break the habit of alcohol. And that really captured my imagination, especially this is being recorded at the beginning of a new year. Often people have resolutions or they are aware that maybe they have drunk too much. Um, and we talk about habit and how you break habits and addiction and how it shows up in your life. Anna is really articulate and tells her story as part of helping others. So I hope you resonate. I hope you'll get something from this. She's an amazing person who does all kinds of interesting things, not just um, her belief coaching. Enjoy our conversation. If you enjoy it, please leave a review. Let me know what your thoughts are. Tell me who you'd like me to be talking to and sharing another door experiences with. Anna, welcome to Another Door Podcast. Before we get stuck in, because I have a habit of just going straight in and then people say, oh, who is Anna? So maybe let's do that bit. Who are you? Give a quick intro. <laughs> well, thank you. So yeah, I'm Anna. Anna Donaghy. I am 25 years a strategist in the creative industry. Actually, I work for an advertising agency and I am the strategy director for a creative and media agency. But the reason why I'm here today, I know, is because I'm an alcohol mindset coach, which is obviously sort of, I have a life of two parts, if you like. So I'm, yeah, strategy director turned alcohol mindset coach. And this is what I'm loving. You see, people are listening now be like, ah, this is where it all comes together because, yeah, this is exactly what Another Door is about. Um, thank you. And again, now I'm resisting all temptation to just ask you about advertising well because when I was 14 in yeah. the 80s, mm -hmm. something like that, let's be vague about when that was, I desperately wanted to work for Saatchi and Saatchi. It was like my dream job. And to this day, I don't know how I found such and such. I, live in, I lived in Cumbria on a farm, no internet in those days, with a black and white tele. It was my dream. I don't know where I found them, but I was obsessed in it. But anyway, it didn't happen. So well done, you're living my dream. <laughs> well, just to make you a little bit sick, I probably, yeah, I, I worked for MNC Saatchi uh, for a number of years. And I think, like, I, I, I hear you, you know, Saatchi's a big names in the industry. And I think, you know, back then and again yes we will be vague they were iconic names so yeah oh well never mind you went a different way <laughs> love it move on you got another door first let's go into your another door moment that's how i like to start these podcasts my another door journey started in my own alcohol problems you know my own alcohol addiction you know i, I think you relate to the fact that another door moments can lead on to many, many more. Yeah. Doors opening, revelations, opportunities, etc. So in the eyes of the world, I was a high performer in a senior role. So the fact that I couldn't control my drinking and I was um stuck, you know, basically confused the hell out of me, scared me to death. You know, I found myself in a place where I was not only just obviously stuck in my drinking, but because of that, you know, I felt so much shame. And so much blame and self recrimination that I just literally I couldn't bring myself to talk to anyone about it. So 
I felt like I was kind of languishing in this pit for quite a long time of self-loathing and sort of self-judgment. I described that as being in a dark and scary room and there are no apparent exits. For me, my biggest another door moment was when I realized that there was a way out of that and not necessarily the typical one yeah. um, that's presented by society and AA hey, and things like that. Wonderful organization. However, you know, I found another door. Mm. And that I think is where, you know, my sort of um, journey out of that room to becoming what I am now, that's where it started. As is so often the case, and and certainly is the case in, in this situation, you know, walking through that door started a journey of just complete transformation, really. I mean, not literally because I had to change. I mean, I had to change. I was in a, you know, not not a very good place. Yeah. And certainly if I'd stayed there, it was not going to end well at all. <laughs> but the, you know, the, the opportunities, I suppose, and the 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 rolling snowball effect of having walked through that door was, you know, has, has obviously been life-changing, which is great. I mean, well, if three years ago somebody had said to me, oh, you're going to be a alcohol mindset coach, I'd have been, <laughs> I, I would have laughed and probably poured, poured myself another drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's, you know, that yeah. kind of the full, that, that's the extent of the journey condensed down into obviously about 30 seconds. But, yeah, that was the most mm -hmm. That's an incredible image of being in a room with no doors. Mm. <laughs> well, it feels, it, it, it does, it feels like that. And, you know, for for anyone stuck yeah. in any situation, you know, literally sort of stuck feeling, you know, like the kind of lights have gone out and they're sort of trying to feel themselves around a space that feels mm. like it's got very sort of <laughs> big and solid walls. That is how it feels. And I, you know, I don't, suggest for one moment that that is specific to alcohol. It can apply to any behavior, any, um, I suppose, addiction, any dependency. It can relate to being in a job. Yeah. You just don't know how to exit or potentially a marriage. I mean, I mean look, it's, it's, a, it's a thing, but definitely it's, it's a sort of metaphor, if you like, how it feels when you're stuck. That was it, really. You kind of sense that there possibly are doors. They certainly don't feel like easy ones to open. That's the difference, isn't it? Yeah. And so do you remember the moment that you did feel, okay, there's a door that I've got to open? Do, do you remember that specific moment? Yeah, I, I do. It's, it's interesting because I think when people talk about addiction, they often think that you suddenly have a sort of a rock bottom moment. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I didn't because, you know, the, the rock bottom moments that I hear about are horrible. You know, you've left your job because of drinking or your marriage has fallen apart because of drinking or you've spent all your money and you're losing your home, your friends, your family, you know, all that sort of stuff. And that, that didn't happen to me. I know that wasn't, that, that wasn't really the way it played out. I just had a series of wake up calls. My marriage was in trouble. I realized that the light was going out and had gone out on all of my ambition um, and all of my dreams and all of my drive and all of my energy. I felt all of that had just gone. And um, my children, you know, were growing up. I mean, they're still young, um, but three years ago, obviously, they were younger still. And they, I just realized that they could see. They could see, you know, they're sponges and they could see what I was doing and they could see that it was causing friction in the house. And I just, yeah, I don't talk about it as a sort of a rock bottom. I bounced a lot relatively late yeah. <laughs> for, quite, for quite a long time and then realized that I absolutely had to do something. Otherwise, that was the trajectory of, of my life. So lots of, yeah, lo lots of things conspired to give me a big shot into action, if you like. And I guess it's that moment, as you say, for people that they feel... Well, yeah, let's keep using that analogy of being in the room that, okay, there's a door that I can walk through. There's change that I can make, but it's not going to be easy. It's that yeah. acknowledgement, isn't it? Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I think, I think the thing is as well, that, that there is such a stigma, there is such a huge stigma around, you know, drinking and the term alcoholic, that it keeps you stuck. You kind of know that there's a doorway, which 
leads to um, admission you are an alcoholic, you know, and, and, a, and a way to sort of wave your hand and, and ask for help. But for me, and I've got to be really, really careful about what I say here, because it's a fantastic organization and it has helped millions of people. But for me, I didn't want to go down that path um, because of the stigma and because I didn't want to accept that I was an alcoholic and because I didn't certainly want to, you know, start a journey there whereby you sort of concede to being an alcoholic for the rest of your life. I was more you know, more interested and more compelled to try and understand why this had happened to me and, and what I could do to sort of back out of this mess. It was about looking looking for alternatives to that really and working, you know, working out what alternatives existed. Well, thank you for being honest with that though, because I think that with a lot of these things and some of the thing topics that we've already mentioned, you're right. There's all kinds of help out there. We know that. But whether you identify and you can bring yourself into that space to identify like, oh, I'm the person that goes to this for help, it can be the very thing that stops you because you're like, no, I'm not. Especially if you're in a high performing job, as you were saying, and on maybe on the outside, it's looking different. You're thinking, no, that, that, that doesn't relate to who I am. So it stops people. You're absolutely right. It's about, it's about who you identify with. And I'm grateful that I just about... I've you know still identified with the principles of you know what what had helped me earlier on in my life, which was drive and curiosity, and being bloody stubborn uh, <laughs> and not saying no. And I I had enough of a kind of a an ember of that going on in my life that just made me, after having had a good talking to from a number of people, you know, made me realise one day that I I did have that. It'd gone. The ember had kind of the spark had gone out, but the ember was still there. And yeah. and same sort of compulsions and all in. You know, when you sort of like you, I, I drank in an all in kind of. <laughs> I'm an all in kind of person. Yeah, yeah. We do really well in my job. So you know, I just had to kind of remember and use that kind of um, muscle myself out of this mess. So. Um, yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't want to identify as an alcoholic, even though you know technically that's that's where I was. I just didn't want the label, and I think that's what's that's what's so tricky because in society we have two types of drinkers, right? If you listen to the way the conversations normally play out, common parlance, you have normal drinkers who are the life and the soul, you know, and the first at the bar and they, those who are able to just go out and have a few and leave it and that's it. And then you have alcoholics, but the perception of an alcoholic is so negative. You know, it's the kind of man or woman sitting on a corner, drinking out of a cramp bag, down and out, terribly sad, pathetic, all that sort of stuff. And it's such a dangerous sort of line that you're either a normal drinker or you're an alcoholic because a lot of people who I know and have met through this job are in a gray area. It is not that black or white, but you know, there's a, there's a gray area there where, you know, people kind of think, well, I'm not an alcoholic, so I'm all right. I just like my drink. I just like my drink. But of course, you know, drink is, drink is addictive. I mean, that's, that's the, the basic fundamental. Yeah. So if you, if you like it and you drink enough of it, it, it is addictive and it's, that's, that's kind of where it starts and finishes. So that gray area, I think, is really, really intriguing. It's where we can feel, you know, before we've, you know, we, we can admit to having a gray area issue much more readily than we can admit to being a full-blown alcoholic. And that's kind of where I go with my coaching now. It feels achievable. It feels... Um... It feels more comfortable to be in that space than take that huge leap of outing yourself and listening to yourself saying that probably is the biggest fear, I guess. Yeah, I, it's a significant difference, obviously, in saying I have a massive problem with my drinking, but I have the power, I, I believe, and it's all about belief, you know, I have the power, I believe, to find a way out of this rather than well, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. And as such, you know, I've given my power, if you like, to alcohol. And that's now my position. 
So, you know, it, it is a really, really sensitive area because I, as I say, I do know that obviously many, 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 many people will have turned to AA and found the solution that they need yeah. in AA. And that's absolutely fantastic. That people find a solution full stop is all that matters. It's for people for whom that nudge into AA just does not feel right for them. You know, there just needs to be an alternative, really. I like what you say as well about the all in piece. Um, as you say, you know, the very thing that got you there is the very thing that can get you out. That's, that's very, I'm going to use the word empowering. You, yeah. That word is used too much, but it feels actually like hope. That's a hopeful statement. It's, it's a really strong position of hope, you know, because, you know, one, one of the things I hear quite a lot is, oh, you know, well, I have an addictive personality, which is, which is fine. You know, it's a, it's a common term. Addictive personalities can be as positive as they can be as negative. So, you know, a lot of the world's CEOs are obsessive certain things or they are all in and when they commit to doing something, they do it kind of 100%. There are kind of no half measures. That, that, and they're strong and they're resourceful and they'll go to great lengths to get what they want, which is, you know, when you start thinking about the parallels there, mm. but, you know, how that can play out positively the determination, the resourcefulness, and I can get what I want, and how I can play out negatively within the realms of addiction. It's the same thing. It's yeah. this personality trait used either constructively or destructively. It was just, just you know, yeah, to, to remember sometimes that we're in a situation because of certain behaviors, but there's always a flip side to those behaviors is, you know, empowering. But it does, it does take that moment of kind of like, <laughs> reflection to sometimes realize that I know it's easy to say and much much harder to see and having that honest conversation with yourself as you say that that's the hardest thing it's it's your you know people are gonna be around you saying look we think is there something going on do you need help but it's you it's your personal conversation it has to be your personal conversation because you know with the best one in the world when you are stuck and then you're in that dark place it, it is really hard for other people to understand where you are and what you're battling. And fundamentally, that you know, with something like addiction, it isn't your fault. You have happened upon a solution in life to feelings that you have or situations that you found yourself in that are sponsored by society. <laughs> right? Alcohol is the most prevalent, most permissive drug in society. Mm -hmm. To therefore fall foul of it and then be accused of or feel shamed by weakness is just ironic, really. You know, it's the, it's the, only, it's the only drug we have to apologize for not wanting to have. <laughs> it's so true. Isn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry I don't drink. <laughs> oh, I don't drink, really? Oh, come on, just have to. Are you all right? <laughs> pregnant? No, I just, I just. Don't want to drink, actually. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it's and it's one um, it's it's bonkers when you think of it oh like that. God, yeah. Society pushes it and then society pulls back from you when this somehow this kind of overly yeah. line is crossed and you just think, well, hang on a minute. And as you say, actively promote it, enjoy it, laugh at it. How many comedies and all of this kind of entertainment is around getting drunk. You know, it's like it's like the biggest joy, especially perhaps in the UK. We we love a good, massive, horrendous drinking session with an awful story. We we just love it. You know, I find it difficult these days to go into a birthday card shop and find a birthday card for a mum or you know someone of my age. I'm some fifty one, some middle aged. Yeah. Find it difficult to find a birthday card that doesn't involve, you know, doesn't involve kind of a wine culture, mum, wow. you know, clock, you know, it's your birthday. She is drinking wine. Yeah. Well, you know, it is. It is absolutely. I mean, I know this isn't going to fall into a debate about how embedded <laughs> it just is. It just is. Yeah. Right or wrong, don't know when it happened. All oh, yeah, yonks and yonks ago. It just. It just is. So it is a tricky one. I, I think it's. I can't remember where we started this particular conversation. It's, it's, just, it's just endemic in society. And when you fall foul of it, it's horrible because, you know, oh, yeah, people people are kind of like, oh, how did you, how did you let it get to this stage? And it's like, it's addictive. 
But until you start really, really, really digging into it, you do blame yourself. Of course you blame yourself because you think, what have I? Yes. Yeah. I become like this. And I think, you know, that key point for me was no, you know, I'm strong and I'm, I'm in, I'm in control of so many other parts of my life, but not this one. Why? Mm. Uh, not, not, not why me, but why does that happen? What's, what's the difference now between me drinking five years ago and me drinking now in this, you know, in this pit that I was in? What's, what's going on? And it's just, yeah, just really sort of dug into that, really. It's asking yourself questions, isn't it? It's being brave with those questions, which I guess is what your work is, which we'll come in, on to in a minute. Cause yeah, fascinating work. Um, I'm a little bit curious. I'm going to ask. You don't have to answer this. But do you feel conflict in some of your work now then? Because given advertising marketing world is so celebratory of the joy of alcohol, it does. This is a really interesting point. And yes, there is conflict and I do not work on any of the advertising accounts yeah. um, in the industry. Um, and, you know, the, the, the principle, the, the advertising industry is, is very, very, very much a reason why obviously alcohol is as embedded as it, you know, we, we like to think that we're impervious the to the controlling mechanisms of advertising etc but we're not um we're hit by it everywhere and of course you know in the in parlance of the industry the the sort of the advertisers do their job and then everyone in society is the word of mouth ambassador have another drink you know this one's really interesting this one's got an oaky taste this one's this yeah. so it, it it just it does it it permeates through the whole of the whole of society and i you know my stand is that I don't work on advertising accounts that have anything to do with alcohol. Mm. I did. I have done I, in my earlier in my earlier days. I have done, but it's you know it's it's not something that I would do now. I, I was actually asked a question by someone the other day about whether the advertising industry is should be more to promote you know the sort of the perils and the impact of advertising because it is uh, sorry of, of alcohol because of course it has such a massive impact on society and people and i'm like yeah it'd be great wouldn't it i mean it, it's gonna be a long time coming for an industry that gets so much revenue out of advertising turns around and bites the hand that feeds <laughs> however I would love to see alcohol companies, the big alcohol companies being subject to the same level of regulation and compliance as happened with nicotine tobacco years ago. Mm. And the advertising industries, you know, the, those in the advertising industry these days, you know, the sort of the big tobacco accounts, the sort of pariahs, you know, they are very, very much the sort of the taboo on the red list of where you don't go. But actually, everything. <laughs> You know, I could do a whole series of podcasts on the impact on health and the impact on society, family, children, accidents, A and E, admission, you know, everything. The impact of alcohol is vastly, vastly greater than the impact of tobacco in the world. Are you looking for somebody to help you rethink your work? Are you looking for somebody who has got something to say, something different? Perhaps you're creating an event, you've got a conference coming up and you're looking for speakers or workshops that really get people rethinking. Check out our platform with fresh new voices and people who've got something to say. Come and see us at recommended.anotherdoor.co.uk. Yeah. So you've gone through this transformation and again, this is why I really wanted to talk to you because lots of people go through the transformation, but they don't pass it on. And what you've done is go, well, I'm going to take it the next step. I'm not just going to be all right myself. I'm going to start doing the work and helping others. And again, that's another door you step through and owning it. And I'd love to hear that, you know, the, your why and your work that you do now. So my why is gratitude. I feel very lucky and very grateful to have found my door. It's been, it's been amazing, you know, I know it's an overused term of it. It's been a, it's been a journey, but it has. Yeah. It has. 
Because all of those things, which were sort of there in the back, those kind of embers that I was talking about, they are all there. They're in you, you know, they're in you innately. They've sparked up into little sort of fires and flavors again. And I, you know, I've got myself a bit strident about the, um, the impact that alcohol has on people and the fact that it's not their fault. I have, you know, had my eyes opened. I've spoken to so many people, Eleanor, who sit within this kind of uncomfortable relate. And people, you know, people don't have to say, oh, I've got a problem. It's yeah. uncomfortable. I, I drink more than I should, but, oh, you know, oh, well, yeah, it is, it, it is what it is. That's not a level of reconciliation, mm-hmm. how much people drink. It's people's, no, I shouldn't, but I do. It's just an area of discomfort that I really help people explore and I help them explore it from that sort of mild levels of discomfort all the way through to, you know, addiction um, and, you know, being being in that sort of quite dark place. And I, I do it because I know how bloody horrible it is and I know that there is a way out. I know, I, I know that there are millions, more people than I could ever reach, obviously, of people out there who who sit within that area and I I just have a sort of a crushing frustration when I see talent mm-hmm. and ambition and dreams fizzle away because people are stuck and don't know how to move towards them. So I, you know, I've always been passionate within my industry about CPD mm-hmm. and you know talent nurturing and making sure well, that kind of the light gets switched on at early stages in people's lives. And I see alcohol as being one of the fundamental reasons why the light gets switched off. And I just feel incredibly sort of duty bound if I feel I know the answer (laughs) or my take on the answer. I just feel incredibly duty bound to help other people. I don't, you know, I've I've had a great career and I've, you know, I, I don't look back on my career with, you know, with any level of you know, regret other than I just believe that my contribution could have potentially been more mm. had I just stayed myself instead of going into this world where, you know, under the influence, I behaved in ways that weren't particularly authentic to me and I didn't build up my own resilience. You know, when I when I came out of my alcohol-soaked problems, I had to do a lot of work on myself to find out how to be resilient instead. Had I had all those tricks and tools 20 years ago, it would have been awesome. (laughs) Can you imagine what you'd be doing right now? (laughs) That is that thing, you know, that imagine if. You know, so 90% of the people and 100% of people I talk to are brilliant and clever and powerful and resourceful with the exception of this one one area of their life which has gone completely haywire. And if you just go, imagine if. What what I sometimes say to people, therefore, which I think is really, really important, is it's not about whether your life has sunk to depths. It's not how low you've sunk and whether your life is in a terrible, terrible, terrible place and there's nowhere lower to go. The flip question is, you know, is your life good enough? You know, what what what's standing if now, if it's alcohol that's standing between you and you supreme, that is still an incredibly valid door to open and start peering around. I was fascinated with the fact you said you felt like you could have been so much more because you already are more, <laughs> but you could have been even more. Do you feel, is there specific moments that you can remember thinking that is when alcohol was taking over and actually holding me back? Uh, most of my 40s. <laughs> <laughs> the entire 40s was yeah. that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> my, uh, I mean, I, I've always been a drinker, you know, whether it was those first sort of sneaky swigs of um, <laughs> alcohol, you know, when you're sort of 15, 16 years of age and that slightly older boyfriend. So I was kind of roped mm. him. Um, they went to university and that was all about having a laugh, wasn't it? And then <laughs> I went into a career where it was kind of, that's what you do. So, yeah. And it was all great fun until it suddenly wasn't. And when it 
when it wasn't for me. I think, you know, I my drinking, in terms of full disclosure here, my drinking ramped up when I had children. I was drinking in the same context as everybody else when I was at work. There was a very level playing field and it was incredibly easy to look both left and right and go, <laughs> I'm not as fun as mine. <laughs> when I left the workplace, albeit sort of temporarily to have children, I genuinely grieved for that stage of my life, my, my working stage. And I missed it. I didn't feel like a mother extraordinaire. I felt uh, I put incredibly high standards on myself, which I've always done. It's a big problem of mine, which I then judged myself very poorly against. I felt like I was, I'd not only given up work, which I was incredibly good at, but I'd started motherhood, which I felt I was relatively poor on at. <laughs> old, bored. Um, you know, lots of different reasons why I just started to drink more, which meant that as I flipped over into my 40s, that was my trajectory. I felt it acutely at work. I felt like I was getting away with it. And I think that this is what I mean when I say I did get away with it, by the way. So that was kind of groovy. So it's not that this is what I mean when I say I look back and I've had a good career and stuff. Yeah. I wonder just how much more I would have got out of it myself and enjoyed it more and learnt more had I not narrowed down my life with drinking. Because for me, that's what it really does. That's why the room is dark and you're on your own because you, you, life shrinks a little bit. Everything starts to evolve around alcohol. You literally find yourself being invited to think, you think, oh, is that a drinking opportunity? Or you stop going, if you're the named driver, you'd rather stay at home. Or even a children's party is better if the mums are having a drink in the corner. Well, thinking, you know, I'm going to bounce along from one event to the other. And suddenly, it, it, you know, you find you're in a bit of a place. What that did for me at work, so I go back to your original question, is I remember feeling I had imposter syndrome because I felt so weak in that regard, in that aspect of my life. I didn't feel like, and I felt like I was getting away with it, literally gripping on, but by the sort of fingertips, I felt like a complete imposter at work. Like I deserved my position. I didn't have a lot of self esteem because of how I was sort of in this moderating cycle of failure. I just didn't feel, I didn't understand why people looked up to me, didn't look up to myself. And I guess alcohol skews your thinking in that space as well, though, must do. Totally. And we, we think about alcohol impairing your judgment in the moment, you know, but actually it, it impairs your judgment over a long period of time, long after it's become a sort of an emotional, yeah. becomes to physiologically actually alter your decision-making processes and your judgment dwindles. So I mean, you know, so my own situation, yes, I was in a, very bad place and that, that was my situation but the question is about why am I drinking yeah. because if I could understand why I was drinking and address those issues then I sort of had some glimmer of hope that I would if, if I could remove the issues then I would remove the need for a solution Wow, that's powerful so you need to sack alcohol basically that's so powerful you're giving it a job wow you have to sack it. You have to say, albeit is now habitual, but at six o'clock in the evening, I'm linking it to cooking dinner or I'm doing it when yeah. trigger is, what is going on with me? What's my emotion? What's my need state that I am saying that that is the answer for? When, you, when you're stuck in a dependency with alcohol, it is there all the time. You're thinking about it all the time, or you're drinking all the time, or you're recovering from it all the time, or you're working out when's a suitable time to have another drink. It's there all the time. It's big. And what you know, what we talk about in our sessions is about making it small. Doesn't mean it has to go away. That's incredible. And as I say, you're passing it on, which is what I hugely admire. But that's been fantastic. And just just sharing your whole story has been a real privilege. So thank you so much. Are you looking for somebody to help you rethink your work? Are you looking for somebody who has got something to say, something different, 
Perhaps you're creating an event, you've got a conference coming up, and you're looking for speakers or workshops that really get people rethinking. Check out our platform with fresh new voices and people who've got something to say. Come and see us at recommended.anotherdoor.co.uk Love this podcast? Give us a five-star review or rate us on Spotify, Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. It can really help us make more great content like this episode and get it out to a wider audience.